extracellular fluid volume excess is characterized by increased fluid in the intravascular and interstitial spaces. Fluid volume excess is always secondary to an increase in total body sodium, which in turn causes water retention. The body's response to effective circulating volume and the efficiency of the renal system have the greatest impact on total body sodium and the subsequent development of fluid volume excess. Other influential factors include excesses related to increased cortisol and aldosterone and conditions resulting in low serum protein and albumin, such as starvation and tissue injury. Effective circulating volume refers to the amount of blood that is necessary to perfuse the tissues adequately. Cardiac output is the most accurate reflection of effective circulating volume. When cardiac output drops, the effective circulating volume drops, and the kidneys retain sodium and water in an attempt to increase effective circulating volume. Sodium and water retention increases arterial hydrostatic pressure and forces fluid from the vascular space to the interstitial space, causing edema. The edema may be both in the pulmonary interstitial space and in the peripheral interstitial space. With renal failure, the kidney's ability to excrete sodium and water is impaired, so excesses in total body sodium and water develop. What are some of the common causes and risk factors of this disorder? When the mechanism is decreased effective circulating volume, risk factors include congestive heart failure and cirrhosis of the liver. When the mechanism is impaired renal excretion of sodium and water, risk factors include renal failure and SIADH, that's syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion. When the mechanism is increased sodium and water retention, risk factors include Cushing syndrome, hyperaldosteronism, and steroid therapy. When the mechanism is decreased serum protein and albumin, risk factors include cirrhosis of the liver, which develops from portal hypertension, malnutrition, burn injury, chronic renal failure, and nephrotic syndrome. When the mechanism is increased intake of sodium-containing solutions, risk factors include high dietary sodium intake and rapid IV infusion of solutions containing sodium. Signs and symptoms of fluid volume excess are primarily respiratory and cardiovascular in origin. The respiratory symptoms are related to fluid congestion in the lungs and pulmonary interstitial spaces. The cardiovascular symptoms develop as a result of fluid overload in the left and right ventricles of the heart. These pressure elevations are responsible for the increased hydrostatic pressure present in the pulmonary capillary bed and the venous system. Signs and symptoms include dyspnea, cough, crackles, rails, hypoxemia, pulmonary edema, weight gain, hypertension, bounding peripheral pulses, jugular vein distension, heart gallops, S3 and S4, peripheral edema, commonly pitting, sacral edema, ascites, and pleural effusion. The diagnosis of fluid volume excess is based almost entirely on the presence of risk factors and selected physical assessment findings. Weight gain, edema, and cardiovascular symptoms are the strongest clinical indicators. Serum protein may be low depending on the cause of the fluid excess. Hematocrit and hemoglobin may appear low due to hemodilution. Treatment of fluid volume excess requires careful consideration of the primary cause. Diuretics, along with fluid and sodium restrictions, will be necessary in most instances. If pulmonary edema or congestive heart failure is present, preload reduction will be necessary. Digoxin and ACE inhibitors can be administered to improve the efficiency of cardiac contractility. Morphine sulfate and nitrate administration will reduce venous return. Corticosteroids may be considered for clients who have nephrotic syndrome to minimize proteinuria and hypoalbuminemia. Weight loss, diminishing peripheral edema, clearing breath sounds, and stable vital signs indicate a positive response to treatment. You can help prevent ECF volume deficit by identifying high-risk clients and detecting signs and symptoms early. To prevent ECF volume deficit, Teach clients to read food labels and limit sodium intake to the prescribed amount. Familiarize the client with foods that are high and low in sodium. 
teach clients to weigh themselves at least once a week and to report gains of three pounds or more from the previous week and to report shortness of breath or increased edema. Perform and document a complete integumentary, respiratory, and cardiovascular assessment so that changes in baseline assessment findings are recognized and treated early. For hospitalized clients, monitor urine output, daily weight, and intake and output, and notify the healthcare provider of any variations from baseline. Total parenteral nutrition therapy is indicated for clients who have acute or chronic illness that interferes with the ingestion or absorption of nutrients into the GI tract at a rate compatible with the needs of the body. Clients who require TPN are commonly hypermetabolic and have increased nutritional needs. Other candidates might have a dysfunctional bowel or a malabsorption syndrome. Initiation of TPN begins with the insertion of a central line. Commonly used central veins include the subclavian vein and the external or internal jugular veins. Tunneled central lines and peripherally inserted central lines, or PIC lines, can also be used. Percutaneous insertion of a central line places the client at risk for pneumothorax. Clients should be monitored for the sudden onset of chest pain, respiratory distress, and chest wall asymmetry during and immediately after the procedure. Correct placement of the line should be verified by chest x-ray prior to starting TPN. A chest tube and insertion tray should be within reach during and after central line insertion. Once the line is in place, use a septic technique for all dressing changes to avoid line sepsis. The TPN solution itself also serves as a good medium for bacterial growth. Dressing changes are performed at least three times per week. Be sure to watch the insertion site closely for redness, swelling, drainage, and odor. Systemic signs of infection include increased white blood cell count, sedimentation rate, and body temperature. TPN solution contains concentrated amino acids, hypertonic glucose, vitamins, electrolytes, and various trace elements. The solution is prepared and administered in a glass bottle that is kept refrigerated until it is hung. No TPN solution should hang at the bedside for longer than 24 hours. No administration tubing should be used for longer than 24 hours. Lipid emulsion preparations are commonly piggybacked into TPN lines. If lipids are added to the system, a 1.2 micron filter should be placed in the delivery system. Hyperglycemia is a common side effect of TPN administration, especially at the beginning of therapy. Blood glucose monitoring and a regular insulin sliding scale will be necessary to assess and treat hyperglycemia. Monitor for signs and symptoms of hyperglycemia such as increased urine output or hyperpnea. A sudden increase in blood sugar might indicate line sepsis if the client has previously adjusted to the glucose concentrations in the solution. To prevent rebound hypoglycemia, hang a 10% dextrose solution to be infused in the event that the TPN infusion is interrupted. It may be necessary to administer vitamin K once per week if the GI tract is sterile and vitamin K is not being produced. Monitor the client's weight and intake and output daily, watching for signs of fluid volume deficit and overload. Do skin care, positioning, and mouth care frequently to prevent skin breakdown and mouth infections.